thank you so much, everybody, for being here. This is such such a privilege and just such a, such a gift to be able to share with you today and to have this opportunity. I'm looking forward to sharing with you and hearing from you uh, and learning from you. I, and I especially want to thank Brad and Chantel, uh, and also thanks to Dr. Goatley, everybody who's, who's been involved that I'm not naming to for, for making this wonderful event happen. So our first talk is going to be focused on this theme of supernatural attributions. And then tomorrow and Friday, we'll get into spiritual struggles. I first, though, wanted to start with the idea of integration, since this is really the theme of this whole symposium. And the theme of integration is something that actually runs through our lives, runs through a lot of my own work. And I like to use metaphors a lot when I'm talking. I prefer to, to work that way rather than giving a lot of numbers and data. So I hope I don't disappoint people who want to hear about numbers and data. We have, I have references on the slides that I'll mostly just skip past to show you the, uh, the details, the research details of what I'm talking about. So that if you have the presentation, you can look up the references, but I'm not going to really talk about those. So what are some metaphors that go along with this theme of integration. Well, some of the ones I found helpful, the idea of a kaleidoscope where life throws at us all these different things and it's a constantly shifting set of patterns that we can choose to see as being beautiful. The theme of light and shadow has been probably the biggest focus in my work as it relates to spirituality. And being able to weave together different experiences, different ideas from various parts of our lives. We have new ideas and we have to figure out where we're going to put them. I'll talk about this more in a later talk, but the idea of kintsugi, this is broken pottery that's a Japanese art form of putting it back together with gold filigree. We'll talk more about that soon. And this theme of a nautilus shell is something that I want to keep coming back to as well. So the nautilus shell, which you might be familiar with, is the home of a little, little mollusk. And the reason I like it so much, and many other people, including the Templeton Foundation, who's funded a lot of our work, use the nautilus shell as a, as a symbol. It's the idea of continued growth. You're kind of cycling around a basic point. And a couple of things that are really meaningful to me about this image are that one is that everything from our past experience, the past ideas that we were exposed to, things that have happened in our lives, different relationships, sometimes as we feel like as we grow or change, especially if, we, if we've had bad experiences, we might want to cut some of those things off and say, I'm not this anymore, or I'm anti this, or I left this marriage or this relationship. This isn't a part of me anymore. I'm separating myself. And there might be some truth to that, but it's still part of our story. It's, we wouldn't be who we are today without that experience. Also, though, sometimes we all have this desire for a simpler time. We want to be able to go back, go back to a former belief system, to an earlier time of our lives, a simpler time in the life of our our country or our world, and the problem is you just can't go back. As the, as the little chambered nautilus grows, he or she can't go back. So today I'm going to talk about this idea of messages from beyond, and supernatural attributions kind of being a more abstract way of talking about that. I wanted to first start, rather than starting off with the topic of supernatural attributions, which might sound kind of abstract, I wanted to start with some specific things that I thought you might relate to. So people in Christianity will often use the types of expressions that I'm going to put up here. Just wondered if any of this sounds familiar to you. God told me. The Lord led me. Jesus spoke to me. The Holy Spirit moved me. So I'm just curious, 
Would you say these types of things yourself? And how would you respond if someone else used this kind of language in talking to me, talking to you? If we had more time, I would give you time to sit and journal about this. But have you ever thought that God was trying to communicate personally with you? Now, keep in mind, I might get very different thoughts about this if I'm speaking to a more secular audience, which I often do. But if you think about a specific time in your life where you think that God might have been trying to give you a message, what was going on? What made you feel so sure or, or to wonder maybe whether God was personally communicating with you? And were there any techniques that you were trying to use to hear from God at that time? So I'm going to be talking about this idea of listening for God's voice as just a starting point here. And one thing I want to be clear about is that this is a psychological line of research. I'm not a theologian. I'm not coming at this from even an explicitly integrative perspective with Christianity. I work at a secular research university. These are basic psychological ideas that could be applied, and I'd love to learn more about people's ideas about integration, but I just want to be clear. In this talk, you won't hear me talking about, like showing my hand about whether I think these things are supernaturally real or not. I'm going to be talking about perceptions, people th perceiving uh, different things, beliefs that they hold and attributions that they make, you know, the way that they explain things. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about it in those terms. So I was first introduced to this idea of God speaking personally to people, actually through a book by Mark Berkler, who was a former Baptist minister who got into this idea that God still speaks to people today. And there are others, others sorry, that should be Willard on that front one. Uh, there are other evangelical uh, thought leaders who have written about this as well. I've also, uh, I spent a lot of my adult life in the charismatic church, uh, almost, almost 20 years. And in the charismatic church, we were very comfortable with the idea of hearing from God uh, and miracles. I had come out of a more, I was raised in a more cessationist type of tradition, which I'll talk about more tomorrow. But in the charismatic church, there's the, the belief that God could be speaking to anybody at any time and that God's doing miracles all the time. Also beliefs in supernatural evil being very active in, in the world. So there are a lot of charismatic books on the topic of how to hear from God or how to hear God's voice. Here's just a few. I also went through training about 15 years ago uh, to become an Ignatian spiritual director. So. Um, Ignatius de Loyola was the founder of the Jesuits. Uh, this is back in the 1500s, had a terrible, he was a, a military guy, had a, uh, an accident where his leg got shattered and was stuck sitting around for a long time and really had a religious or spiritual transformation and made these spiritual exercises to basically help people discern God's voice in their lives. So, I went through a program to become a spiritual director in the tradition of, of St. Ignatius. So that was very interesting because I got to hear more about that the, the, there's a whole Catholic and other contemplative set of traditions around hearing from God as well, which I hadn't been familiar with when I was just coming out of the evangelical or, or charismatic world. So all of these experiences that I had coming more out of my own religious life fed into some research ideas that we were able to explore about a, about a decade ago now. So Valencia Harriot uh, was a master's level student working with me. This was, she has her PhD now, but this was her master's thesis where we looked at perceptions of God's voice. And what we did was we looked at 460 adults in the United States. This is just an online survey of, and these are people who believed in God. And we asked a lot of questions, but I'm just going to focus on a few of them here. 
one thing that we asked was, how do you think God communicates with people? In just one way, a few different ways, or many different ways? Most people said they thought that God communicates in many different ways. So this would go against the idea, for example, that God only speaks through scripture or only speaks to people through a little voice in their head. How often do you believe God tries to communicate with people? And here you saw a little bit more of a, a curve where people said sometimes. So people weren't necessarily on average seeing this as something that was going on really frequently, but it also wasn't something that was reserved for rare occasions. Do people need to have special abilities or qualities to receive a message from God? Now, this is really an important question because in so many traditions, the idea is you have to be uh, a prophet, perhaps, um, maybe in some traditions a, a priest or somebody else, a special saint who's getting these types of messages. So to claim that you're hearing from God could seem kind of arrogant, like because it's only supposed to be for special people. People definitely said no, not. Uh, definitely not. Even Homer Simpson can hear from God is the basic, <laughs> the basic message that we had. You do not need special abilities. So different ways that people perceive God's voice. These were ones that we included in our study. Obviously through scripture and sermons, and this was one of the more highly endorsed ways that people said, yeah, I hear God's voice this way. Also through meaningful life events, and this was a, could include a whole range of things, you know, things falling into place, having uh, a sign of something that's important that's going to happen and then it, it comes true, series of things that you might wonder if it's a coincidence, but then you think, no, this actually makes more sense as God is intervening or God's giving me a message. through a spontaneous thought. So uh, Tanya Lerman, who I believe spoke at the Integration Symposium a few years ago, has done fabulous uh, anthropology-based work looking at a Christian congregation and a charismatic congregation and how they believed they were hearing from God. And a lot of the emphasis there, and this was what I got from Mark Verkler too, was the, this idea of these spontaneous thoughts that drop into your mind. You know, you might be seeking, may, might try to imagine that you're in a situation where you're talking with Jesus or something, and then you just see what drops into your mind. Or else, sometimes a thought will just randomly occur to you. And if it's something that seems meaningful and seems to click, sometimes people will attribute those to God. Also through the kindness or love of another person, and this was actually the number one answer. Also through other media, though, so things like, things like art, and nature were also endorsed a lot. And sometimes physical sensations. So I, I know I have a few people in my life who will say, oh, I know it's God because I just got goosebumps. Or people will have a feeling of something oppressive if they feel like it's the devil, for example. But we won't get into the, the devil stuff right now. And finally, through an audible voice, but this seems to be more, more rare. Sorry, that looks like that's getting cut off a little bit on the slide. So very few people are hearing the audible voice of God, but some people did endorse it. So I'd like you to just think about this and think about your own beliefs and biases. Would you, if somebody came to you and said, God told me and told you something, we like to use this metaphor of different lenses that we can use to, that, to interpret res, reports of supernatural activity. So might you view this as a sign of a serious mental or medical illness? Might you think that they, they were psychotic or had a brain tumor or were experiencing a, a bipolar episode, something like this? We call that the mental illness lens. Or would you see it the result of normal psychological processes? You know, you can understand why a person would think this based on their cultural background and what they've been taught, 
maybe their meaning making processes? Or would you think that, no, God was actually speaking to the person? I, I believe that. So we call these the serious mental illness lens, the normal psychological processes lens, or sometimes we'll call it psychotherapy lens or the supernatural lens. And you could use multiple ones, of course. It's also important whether or not you want to believe this or not. People, I'll get more into this later, but we do have our motivations to use different lenses. And depending on which lens you use, you can imagine you'd have quite a different response to somebody if you're seeing something as a, the result of a psychotic break versus thinking that, no, God's actually speaking to the person. But what about this? So I'm talking about hearing from God, and I would imagine a lot of you in the room are probably familiar with that idea. But what if somebody came to you very earnestly, and what if the voice was from a different God, like Shiva? What do you think, how would you interpret it then? Or what if somebody claimed to be having a very similar experience to everything that you've heard about with hearing from the Holy Spirit, but they're saying this was from the goddess? How would you think about that? Now, about somewhere around 70% or so of people in the United States believe in the devil. So if, if God talks to people or affects their lives, what about the devil, demons, or evil spirits? Could these be affecting people in their day-to-day -day lives as well? So if people think that the devil is attacking or the evil spirits are attacking, how might they try to protect themselves? So if somebody's picking up the supernatural lens, they might turn to different spells or maybe something like a talisman to try to ward off evil. In, in Christian culture, we're more used to hearing about things like putting on the armor of God or engaging in other types of spiritual warfare, maybe uh, breaking bonds of spiritual oppression. There might be things like exorcism or deliverance. And one thing to keep in mind, we tend to have these male images in our Christian tradition. But spiritual warfare could be pretty appealing to women, too. It's a way for women to feel powerful and to feel like they can go out and be playing an important spiritual role in this fight, even if they're not supposed to go out and fight like men do in other ways. So this could have some appeal for women, too. And that, I have found that to be overlooked. I found people have laughed when I've said that before. There's lots of books on spiritual warfare. The one on the left um, on deliverance from evil spirits was the one that we used 20 years ago when I took a spiritual warfare and deliverance class through my charismatic church. Uh, Peter Wagner from, from Fuller has a long history of focusing on spiritual warfare. And you see there's even a women's guide up there. <laughs> Lots of books on spiritual warfare. So let's go back to this idea. So if somebody came to you and said that the devil was attacking me, or there was some kind of, I'm, I'm dealing with some kind of a curse, how would you tend to frame that? Let's focus on some things about the afterlife now. So in Christianity, there are certain beliefs about an afterlife that most Christians tend to learn about. Well, I'm just going to call these traditional beliefs because they're traditional in this culture. Things like heaven, hell, maybe purgatory if you're Catholic. And a lot of people believe in reincarnation, more so in other traditions, but people might be taught to believe that. These are all things that people could be taught to believe about the afterlife. But often they're based on teaching rather than personal experience these things that we believe about the afterlife. And the problem is that people might have experiences that don't fit with the teachings very well. So this can raise a lot of big, thorny theological questions for people. What, what do I do with this experience that I had or that somebody told me about that I don't know where to put it in my, my theological grid? So... Being raised in a fundamentalist church, which I'll talk more about tomorrow, 
I was raised very much anything having to do with the afterlife that's not about heaven or hell. We don't talk about that. If people think they're getting messages, it's probably demonic. It was very much, I didn't even want to talk about it or think about it when some of these books came out, like Melody Beattie's Embraced by the Light and some of these other ones uh, a couple of decades ago. That stuff just freaked me out and I avoided it. Uh, there was a book, though, about a decade ago by Eben Alexander, a neurosurgeon called Proof of Heaven, that focused on his, his experience as a, a near-death experience that was really powerful and turned him from a skeptic into somebody who believed strongly. That book had a big impact on me. And there are lots of other books and projects focusing on this topic. A lot of the really excellent work comes out of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia. That's really ground zero for a lot of this work. We have a paper that's under review right now, just reviewing di some different experiences that people report are related to belief in an afterlife. These are the kinds of things that could persuade people that there's a supernatural reality there. And we use these metaphors of vision, pursuit, memory, and journey. So really briefly, visitation have to do with these encounters related to the afterlife that people are not seeking out. So you might see a ghost, you might have an experience that's called after-death communication. I would call it perceived after-death communication, where people think that they're getting a message from a deceased loved one. Or there are phenomena, sometimes used to be called deathbed visions, now they're usually called nearing-death awareness, where people who are very close to death will seem to be interacting with maybe deceased loved ones, and like they're getting ready to go and talking to them. Very common. You'll hear hospice workers talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, we have some papers on the topic. Kathleen Pate's a graduate student working with me. I'm not going to go into the details of the paper specifically. So pursuit, these are encounters that people are seeking out. So you might try to talk to your deceased loved ones. You might go to a medium to try to get a message, or you might pray to saints. And then there are what we call memory experiences. There's a pretty big literature on reincarnation memories. And there's also a phenomenon called terminal lucidity, which is at least loosely related. This is where people who've had um, like a dementia process going on and maybe haven't recognized anybody or been oriented to where they are in a long time, shortly before they die, all of a sudden they're clear as a bell and they're right there. And it's like they're back again and they remember who they are and they remember everything. Sometimes people will frame that in supernatural terms too. And then finally, we've got journey. This is where people perceive that they have left their body and visited another world. So this is very common in near-death experiences. There's also a phenomenon that uh, William Peters just wrote a book about called shared death experiences. These are some of the ones that I, I really find fascinating. This is where a person who's maybe at the bedside or even somewhere else their loved one passes, and it's like they, they go with them, <laughs> and they see their loved one, you know, like, going, you know, they'll see, like, other deceased people from the family, and they'll see the loved one maybe going and having to go, you know, say goodbye, you know, go across the bridge or through the tunnel, and, and they're left here. Fascinating. I wish I could talk more about that, but it is a thing. And then different types of out-of-body experiences, and some of these take the form of uh, psychedelic trips or other types of mystical experiences where people feel like they're touching some other reality. So we did a study about a year and a half ago, we're starting to publish from it now, the idea of whether people see psychedelic substances as gateways to spiritual messages. And it turns out that among U.S. adults, it's, it's fairly common. We didn't have a representative sample, but some people see psychedelic substances like magic mushrooms, psilocybin, uh, things like LSD, ecstasy, as ay ayahuasca. There's all a variety of different, different uh, substances. People might see these as doorways to messages from these supernatural entities. So it could be something like the god or the devil or a, a spirit of nature or a person, a loved one, was giving a message when I had this psychedelic trip. And even if it's not a specific, what we might call supernatural agent or entity, people might see psychedelics as opening up the doorways to some other spiritual domain, like a higher consciousness 
or a true self that exists beyond time and the, the limitations of the material world. The idea with you know, our physical body here would be like an incarnation of that. Or other dimensions of ultimate reality. Often people will say, ah, with mystical experiences, people will often say, I know that this was this experience that I had, this is what was actually real. And the things that we see here are more shadows of what that reality is. And I realize that not everybody here might be comfortable with these ideas. I'm deliberately trying to you know, shake some things up a little bit here. Um, so here's the prompt that we used in our recent psychedelic project. We just asked people to imagine that someone they trusted said that they had this intense, life-changing experience after taking a psychedelic. And this was the prompt that we gave. So I had this amazing realization that we're all connected, not just people, but even the animals and the plants. It, everyone and everything in the universe is connected, and it's all about love. I had a profound sense that I was actually being embraced in a divine love and that everything was truly good. People will often report these types of things uh, in mystical experiences, sometimes triggered by psychedelics. So here's what I'm wondering. Would you tend to frame reports of these afterlife-related experiences or mystical experiences as being mental or medical illness, normal psychological processes, supernatural reality? It's a little different from just the, God told me. And would your opinions differ if the experience was triggered by a psychedelic? Would that make you more likely to think, oh, it's just physical or that's it's demonic or... What would you think about that? So we'll come back to the lenses at the very end. Now I'm going to go back to talk about this broader topic of supernatural attributions, because all the things I've just been telling you about all fit into this broader category that we're trying to use in our work to tie these different threads together. Uh, Josh Wilt and I just wrote um, our big review paper on supernatural attributions. We were very happy to get an invitation to put this in the annual review of clinical psychology, which is unusual. I'm not used to uh, non-psychologists of religion being interested in our work on these topics. So this was a nice opportunity. It also killed my sabbatical because I was not planning to write this big paper, but now, now we have the paper. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the time here are things that are from this paper. I'm just gonna hit a few highlights and if you want more details, you can check out the paper itself. So you can see why I didn't wanna start off the talk with this because it sounds more abstract, but this is actually all the things we were just talking about, supernatural attribution. This is basically this idea that a supernatural entity played a role in causing or influencing some event. And an event is defined really broadly. This could be external things or even something like thoughts or feelings. And when I say use the language of an entity, it could be a personal agent, like a personal God or a human spirit or a devil, or it could be something like an impersonal force, like karma or luck or fate, the, the universe itself. So it's very broad. And our papers have had to be very broad looking at a bunch of different entities. So the key question here is, what makes people think that something supernatural is going on or, or might be going on? So when you first think of what would make me think something was supernatural, what might occur to you are what we've chosen to call direct effects. These are the really dramatic things that seem to violate natural laws. Like there's no other way to explain it except to invoke the supernatural. So you can he see here, I've got the supernatural thing causing the event to kind of skipping over the natural. So something like Moses parting the Red Sea or God parting the Red Sea, you know, through, through Moses' actions. And there are lots of accounts of miracles that you'll see, you know, you, those of you who are in the Christian tradition are going to be I've heard lots of testimonies about exciting things and miracles. Certainly in the charismatic tradition, we, we lived on this stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, amazing healings, food multiplication. I mean, there's all kinds of 
fascinating things that people will report and attribute to, to God's intervention. And also some of the afterlife things that I was talking about earlier also could fit into this category. It's like people are glimpsing some dimension or having an experience that they see as kind of challenging or maybe violating our usual natural laws. It's kind of like the other world is reaching into this world in some way. So these direct effects, these more dramatic things, these are the things that seem to violate natural laws. That's why we think it's supernatural. And these are the things that are really dramatic and attention grabbing. So these have the wow factor. These are the kinds of things, there's a reason people get up and share these as testimonies in church, right? These are the amazing things that are going to get people to believe that there's actually a, a God there who does amazing things. So these are the kinds of things that if you experience this yourself, or maybe even heard a really amazing story or testimony, it could lead to a major shift in your beliefs. Something like a conversion. Or you might even start a new religion or belief system based on an amazing experience that you had. But so many of our attributions that we make about supernatural events don't seem to require these kinds of dramatic experiences. A lot of it's much more everyday. And the idea here is that supernatural entities can work indirectly through nature. So here you've got the supernatural is affecting the natural in some way, but what we just see is like the natural thing causing the event. So here, there's no obvious violation of natural laws. If there is something that's kind of going on behind the scenes, and we, we can't pin it down that way. And so there's nothing really obvious. And this is the kind of thing that maybe you might feel very clearly that God spoke to you, or that something was demonic, or that it was karma. But you're not going to probably convince a skeptic, because it's based on your own personal meaning system. So you might feel completely convinced, but for somebody who's skeptical, they're like, you know, where's the evidence? This is all just natural stuff. These are coincidences happening, that you're just trying to make meaning from them. Sorry, I was having my, all of a sudden, this whole, all my clicking happened at once. <laughs> so these are cases where events might seem to be unfolding in a meaningful way. So it's like the timing of things just seems perfect, or you get an answer to, you know, some money comes in at just the right time, or you, you see, uh, you know, your, your loved one just passed, and then all of a sudden you look up and there's a rainbow. It's like right there. You know, there are things, things like that, or patterns, things that seem to happen in a meaningful pattern or are repeated. You know, three times today I've had this happen. I remember my, my mom used to say, uh, when there were three times in a day that, like, awful things happen, she'd, she'd be like, okay, it's got to be the devil. You know, three times it has to be, the, you know, because this day, I, and I easily could have done that with my, with my travel thing. <laughs> I can tell you that, you know. So, so it's like just, you know, when things are over and over. But you might be, there might be a certain animal that keeps crossing your path, or, or you keep encountering things uh, that are certain people saying things to you, or songs that keep repeating, all kinds of things like this that we assign that meaning to. And it suggests some kind of a meaningful message to us. It could be guidance or comfort, or it could even be something negative like a temptation. Sometimes you might have, like uh, Tanya Lerman talked about, just these spontaneous thoughts or intuitive hunches that just seem to resonate you might have physical sensation, like my, my friend who would get chills and be like, it's God, or maybe a sense of peace or a sense of dread. Or... So people might have these internal signs that they use, like this is my sign that it's, that it's God or that it's the devil or that, it's my, that my deceased parent is here. I know because I always feel this way. And as we talked about before, the idea of God working through nature or another person could be something else going on here too. So a few years ago, we took these ideas, starting with all that stuff about hearing God's voice, you know, 
Do you think that God speaks to everyone or just a few people? Do you have to have special abilities? And applied that to all these different entities like the devil and spirits. And again, we always have to try to make things more abstract so that we can apply them to different psychological situations. So we came up with this idea of what we called supernatural operating rules. It's basically, how do you think God works? Assuming that you think God exists. Does God still talk to people today? Does God talk to uh, intervene in everybody's life or just a few people? Does God have the power to go in and change the events of your life? Or is God kind of more limited in, in some way? What's going on? And the same questions about the devil, spirits, etc. So people tend to see the super, supernatural entities as more active in their lives if they see them as powerful, intentional, and broad in their scope of activity. They talk, they, they talk to everybody all the time as opposed to these few people occasionally. So why do people make these supernatural attributions? My, my main point here is that it's not just one reason. And I'm gonna go through these reasons quite quickly. The paper goes into a lot more detail, but that's a, a big take home point. It's not just because of what we're taught. It's not just because of experiences we've had. So we propose, uh, Josh Wilt and I, three broad sets of reasons. So a supernatural explanation has to come to your attention. It has to be at least reasonably plausible. And motivation can play a role. Do you want to believe that it's God? Do you want to believe it's your loved one communicating with you? Why do people do this? Well, there's all this socialization and evolutionary reasons. A lot of what we believe about, about these entities is what we've been taught. Then there's personal factors like, did you believe in God before? Do you want to believe that your loved one's talking to you? Do you tend to be a person who operates more based on intuition versus really analytical thinking? Might, might you have tendencies towards uh, psychotic thinking? And then there's these immediate contextual factors, like are other, do other people around you seem to be thinking that this is God or the devil? Have you just prayed and been seeking an answer to something and then something happens? So those are some of the reasons that we might make these attributions. So it's these broader cultural reasons, uh, some more, and then some more personal reasons, and then there are specific situational things. It all plays in. But why should we care about any of this stuff? Well, we've been recently thinking about supernatural beliefs and attributions as being amplifiers. So if you think of the supernatural as being above or beyond the natural, we think about supernatural attributions kind of turning up the volume on existing ideas. They add psychological weight, or our very technical term, they add oomph. <laughs> if you can attribute something to the supernatural, it seems to have more behind it. So... One reason to care is that these can be really powerful coping resources. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna run through these five things on the next few slides. So I'm just gonna put that up there right now. So if you think that God loves you, that's gonna provide these positive emotions. If you, if you think God's giving you gifts, you're gonna feel grateful. If you think your loved one lives on, that's gonna be comforting and exciting. I'm earning good karma, might make you hopeful about the future and maybe also a little proud. So this is, this is helpful stuff for people. Um, my, my very close friend and, and colleague, Ken Pargament, has a huge body of literature on religious coping. But some supernatural attributions are linked with distress too. So they can, they can be these coping resources and lead to distress. Talk more about this in the struggles talk, but God is punishing or abandoning me, doesn't love me. The devil's attacking me. I've got bad karma, bad luck. And if you have something like a disorder where there are hallucinations or delusions going on or dissociation, those are associated with super, certain types of supernatural attributions as well. I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but we already know there's many studies on how these negative attributions correlate with distress. Sorry, my clicker is starting to die a little bit here, I think. I may have to go to the keyboard. So the glass is really kind of overflowing on this. So 
demonic attributions can certainly cause struggle. So saying the devil is being active in the world could make the world seem pretty scary. And it could be really distressing to think that the devil is attacking or tempting me. I could feel guilty or afraid. Might be afraid that if the devil pulls you off path, you're going to go to hell. But an important point here that we're just starting to get into is that not all demonic attributions lead to struggle. So they have their appeal. There are other reasons to make them. So they can clarify what do we think is right and wrong. It can help us to behave in ways that are in line with that. Also, you can protect yourself from dangerous other people by telling yourself that they're following the devil. We'll come back to that. Because it could encourage people to have these different types of good behavior and give you a sense of purpose and energy and confidence. I'm fighting the good fight. And people want to have something to fight. Not all personalities, but a lot of personalities really do want something to fight. Also, there's this ego boost, like I'm a threat to the dark side. You know, that's, that, you know, why is the devil attacking me? Because I'm a threat. So supernatural attributions can also guide important personal decisions, everything from career. What are you being called to? Am I supposed to marry this person? Different things around health behaviors and, and coping methods. Am I going to go to see a, a medium or not after my loved one dies? And they relate a lot to moral judgments, too. Uh, there's some great work that's come out on the idea of supernatural norm enforcement. Uh, Sindel White has done a lot of this work. This, there, and this is coming from an evolutionary perspective. There's this pretty well-documented idea that the threat of punishment keeps people in line. So it could apply to God or karma, like this fear of going to hell or being punished by God. Countries with stronger hell beliefs have longer, lower crime rates. Azim Sharif did work on that. So it is serving kind of a function to believe that there's negative stuff like this going on. And of course, the idea for anybody coming from a Christian program, this, this question about how to interpret the authority of scripture is going to be a, a crucial question. So this, once you put the sacred authority behind a book or a tradition, you can see it's going to add oomph to everything, right? So you, if you treat these as divinely inspired, uh, and if you take a fundamentalist approach, benefits of that is it's going to provide clear guidance. If you're feeling really certain that this is God's word, this needs to be followed to the letter, it's clear. And it can also provide protection against doubts. This is the way that it is. And it can also fit with, with certain values, like trying to keep things pure, following authority, and knowing who's in and who's out of the group. Jonathan Haidt's work on that. But there's some challenges here of interpretation. So I'm sure none of this is relevant to anybody in this room. So, do people see the Bible as a divine document, a human document, a mix of both? Which version? Which parts? Inerrancy controversies? Have the books been closed? Or is there still new revelation? I'm just going to keep going because I'm sure that's not has no relevance. So, so uh, should the text be taken literally? Well, just think about the Bible. Your opinions about that could shape attitudes about all kinds of things. War, capital punishment, Divorce, even in cases of abuse, sexual orientation, gender identity, slavery, women's rights, animal rights, environmental concerns. So it's pretty important stuff. And finally, in terms of reasons to care, a lot of the dark side has to do with the abuse of religious authority that can go along with supernatural attributions. So if somebody claims to be to have divine authority, they could really use that to control people, can be part of a lot of religious trauma and misinformation. Also, this idea that God is on our side can lead us to derogate out groups and be hostile to them because they're following the devil if we're following God. And often these are reflected in religious nationalism. 
sorry, my animations weren't coming up at quite the right time there. <laughs> okay. Don't have much time to talk about this, but Christian nationalism as one form of religious nationalism has been linked to some of the things on this screen through some really good sociological work. And Kristen Cobes Dumay has done more of a historical account focusing on masculinity within Christian nationalism. Sorry that I don't have more time to talk about that, but check out these sources if you're interested. We did a study on demonic attributions for COVID vaccines and found that people who tend to, to see it as demonic had not only more anti-vax attitudes, but they had more anger at the people who got vaccinated, were more likely to see them as their enemies and as evil, people who got vaccinated are evil. And the Christian nationalism and conspiracy types of thinking both went with this. So these are some references about these dark side ideas. And these could affect these interpersonal and intergroup relations. So on the bright side, God loves everybody. <laughs> God wants us to be at peace and to love and respect each other. And the enemy is hatred or division itself. Um, also believing that everything is fundamentally interconnected could be really positive. So, so these supernatural attributions could add oomph on the positive side or on the negative side, that we have a new project under review that's focused on this idea. Quick wrap up here, just going back to the lenses very briefly. So the serious mental illness lens, what's good about this? Well, if somebody tells you that they're seeing the devil over in the corner and they are actually having a hallucination, you want to know that they're actually having a hallucination and to, to help them find treatment. The big problem here, of course, is that a lot of times people's legitimate spiritual experiences are treated as, they're framed immediately as being things like hallucinations and delusions and treated as psychopathology. There's a long history of this in psychology and psychiatry where people think they're going crazy and might receive unnecessary treatments, medications, very stigmatizing. In terms of the psychotherapy lens, benefits of this, of framing it as a normal process of psychology, is that it really helps us to explore some of the cultural and religious diversity and beliefs, all the differences in what people are socialized to believe. That can be really helpful. It can be destigmatizing, and it might encourage more sharing because you're not shutting down the person's experience. And you might help them to get some really good insights about what's going on. It also kind of keeps you in your lane professionally, that you're, I'm a, I'm a psychologist or a counselor. We're just talking about that. <laughs> some, some issues, though, might be that you might, again, miss serious mental illness if you frame it this way, because you might be normalizing it so much. Like, this is culturally normal, and you're trying to be very uh, inclusive and, and culturally sensitive, but you might miss a dissociative state because you're trying so hard to be culturally sensitive. You could also cause people to overanalyze and kind of strip the magic from the experience by overanalyzing it psychologically. This happened to uh, Therese of Lazou, um, who had a wonderful experience, felt like she had to go tell her mother superior about it, and it just killed it. And it could really cause us to dismiss or ignore the, the person's supernatural framing of the experience. They think it's supernatural, and you're just explaining it psychologically. I'm sure many of you have probably been to therapists where you've had this experience. Well, it's nice that you believe that, but it doesn't connect, because if it's life-changing for you, and it's just psychological for the other person that can feel very dismissive. And finally, the supernatural lens. So if you were to adopt the supernatural lens and the person talking to you also did, this really validates their experience. It might be exciting and it might open the door to new intervention possibilities. Maybe we're gonna seek deliverance or maybe we're going to incur have prayer in our session. But there's some costs too, so there's some ethical issues where some interventions can be harmful. Uh, for a good example of this, very dramatic, uh, exorcism in uh, Scott Peck's book, on Glimpses of the Devil. So I would highly suggest that people not get involved with 
exorcism or deliverance as part of psychotherapy, very risky with boundaries and power dynamics. Also, if you immediately take these things as being supernatural, you could again miss serious psychological or physical problems by just agreeing that it's supernatural without checking it out. And there can be some real challenges around referral. Who are you going to refer to for exorcism or deliverance? Do you trust them? Do you even believe in this? This is very tricky. And could the client become dependent on someone, like they go to a spirit medium and now they feel like they have to keep going back to that person to get messages? Sometimes the, the supernatural lens might also be disorienting for the therapist if it change, changes their own beliefs. So clinically, just do a thorough assessment, try to give a safe environment for sharing, be aware of your own biases, and consider where you're, whether you're the right therapist. And try to get familiar with literature and resources on these different topics. Remember, we, we see through a glass darkly on all of these things. <laughs> and that's what I have. Thank you. <laughs>